good. It talks about all the types of flies. It talks about the equipment, uh, the gear that you need. Um, and I'll, I'll just walk through it briefly at the beginning uh, for those okay. people that have, that have not done any saltwater fishing. Uh, and then um, I thought we could um, have Clark talk a little bit about his experience with saltwater. I know he's, he's got uh, um, the Christmas Island. I think you've done other saltwater too, haven't you, Clark? A little bit, yeah, a little bit. Mostly Christmas Island. That's yeah. what I'm generated. And then, um, um, actually, I mean, what do you think? Do you want me to start off with uh, the Bahamas and Mexico, then get it, and then have you, Clark? Take come in and then maybe Rick, you can finish up with, with uh, Steelhead. Fine by me. Maybe that would be the order that we should go. Uh, I'll, I'll do it that way. Rick Vogel. Rick, Rick, uh, how's your uh, ribs doing? Uh, you know, <laughs> I was kidding, kidding to my wife just a moment ago. I'm about ready to get back on my bike, but <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not that far along yet. But I, I did a nice, uh, you know. Uh, 20 minute walk today and I'm, I'm really feeling better. Good. I might get out of my uh, recliner and get back into the bed again after a couple of weeks now. So. <laughs> yeah, wow. Yeah, uh, at least you're still with us. <laughs> hey, yeah, that's right. That's a real positive. Could have been a lot worse. So Rick Vogel, when are you getting back? Getting back from where? From Oregon. Oh, I've been back for- Oh, you're back. Weeks. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you guys go there quite often, and uh, it's. it's uh... Well, I don't usually go in February, but the kids went to Hawaii, and we had to cover the grandkids. So. Oh well, that's great though. Hey, you know, that's. You know, the nice thing about being a grandparent, like it is, you can give them back. You know, at some point, so. <laughs> that's for sure. You can enjoy them and then give them back. Yeah. Rick. Rick, what, tell us about your bike accident briefly. Oh, how do you know uh, about the, how do you know about that? Well, somebody well, mentioned you, you it. Said it. Somebody mentioned it, but oh, yeah. we bike we bike a lot. And I'm just wondering, did you collide with some other bikers on the bike trail? No, 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 no. no. I I bought a, I bought a new Italian bike last summer, and I readjusted the seat and. Um, Two months after I did that, it came loose going around a corner. Fortunately, I was on a flat area. Uh, I tore a tendon in my shoulder. Oh, that my God. The doctor said <laughs> was inoperable. And oh. I've got a bump on my shoulder that I now will have for the rest of my life. Um, but it doesn't hurt. And I was playing golf within six weeks. So hey. it's all good. Are you, you still know, are you, are hey, you Larry, Larry, you yeah. were... You were, uh, I think you were responding to what Dean was saying, and I had a, I'm the other Rick with a okay. bike accident, yeah. and it was self-inflicted. I was actually watching something off the side. I went up onto the median up there by the preserve. You know how it's full of rocks? Oh, yeah. Okay. And I, uh, I looked up as I was catapulting up over the median, <laughs> and I crashed on the rocks. It broke six ribs. Oh um, my! <laughs> and I did that two weeks ago. Well, Amen. they're probably spare ribs, so it's yeah. weird, right? <laughs> yeah, the oh, little, little, Chinese, little, bit, little barbecue joke here. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> it must. It, it must be. Uh, it must be contagious. It might me not to go biking. <laughs> I have two bikes, but I hardly ever use them. You know. Well, that's true. We bike quite a bit, usually, but we don't go on the roads. We go on the bike path, which sometimes that gets pretty dangerous, too, when there's a dog that runs in front of you or somebody yeah. with a baby cart that won't move over. And Well, you guys live right around the corner from us because I remember seeing your son quite a bit that's the bike mechanic specialist. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's doing well. Uh. Now. There's Linda. There's Linda. We can start now. She, the lead, our leader is here. So yeah, right. I think you've been leading most of this stuff, Dean. <laughs> you just go, boy. Well, um, I guess it's three o'clock. Why don't we get started, uh, Rick? Your host. Oh, I have the host. Okay. Yeah. You're um, all set. For those of you who have, who have done 
you know, saltwater fishing, and you have to bear with me for a minute. I, I thought oh. I would share. Hey, uh, excuse me, Dick. I mean, uh, Dean. Yeah. Uh, Rick, hit record, please. It's it's on. Okay, okay. great. Thank you. Right. I remember. Um, I remembered. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, after after six sessions, we're getting better at this, you know. <laughs> hey, Dean, uh, just as before we all start, can can we get a a show of people here uh, that have done some saltwater fishing so we don't, you know, just do overkill? Is it, Are there some people here other than the presenters that have done saltwater or not? I know I Rick, have. Rick has. I have. Rick has. Yeah. Yeah, I'm Bill Bowers. I've done some. Okay. okay. I just thought that would be helpful to know. And uh, like, one of the things I one of the things that Linda and I were talking about is that you know I know that there are places that uh, um, you know Rick Rupp and Clark and I have not been to and and you know this is an open discussion so I mean if if there's a, a place that uh, someone has been to that uh, that we should talk about I mean I, I hope you guys will, will chime in um, what I was going to say was I I found a uh, a checklist that I received. Um, from a guy named Vince Tobia, and he runs an, uh, an operation called uh, Cataragus Creek Outfitters. And what he does is he he uh, he has trips to the Bahamas, Mexico, uh, Alaska, um, New York for steelhead, uh, Canada. And um, we actually, um, I've never actually met him. I've talked about him on the phone a lot of times. But anyway, he sent us a checklist and uh, what I thought I'd do is start off, if, if the people that have been saltwater fishing will just bear with us, I wanted to spend a few minutes on the checklist and then uh, I'm gonna send it to Linda and then Linda can post it and anybody that wants it can, you know, can download it. So let me see, here. share the screen, share. And here is the checklist. <laughs> Um, and it, it, it's pretty, uh, he's got a lot of stuff in here. He talked about um, the, the primary fish uh, in the Bahamas, Mexico, Venezuela, a lot of the Caribbean, uh, that the guides and, and we fish for, the bonefish. So he gets into, you know, the tackle, uh, seven to nine weight. He talks about, uh, you know, the reel, uh, you know, holding at least 150 yards. Uh, wait for it floating. He gets into um, all of it, you know, the tippets and all that. And then he talks about the flies that uh, that you pretty much have to have, you know, to to fish for these particular fish. And um, then he gets into the permit, the same thing, nine to ten weight. Um, if you're fishing for smaller permit, you can probably go down to an eight. Um, the, I only caught one permit in my life and that was with an eight weight. So, you know, I, I know that uh, it takes longer to bring it in, but uh, it's a lot easier to cast an eight weight than a nine or 10 weight. And then he, he this is the one area I don't agree with him. Uh, tarpon tackle nine to 10 weight. Um, I think that if you're fishing for big tarpon and I, I know tarpon in Florida can go to 150 pounds to 200 pounds. They can be seven or eight feet long. And uh, I, don't, I think you need a 12 weight. I mean, I think you, you, you probably, if you had a 10 weight, uh, you would break it. Um, so I, I don't think you can, you can catch a tarpon and, and land a tarpon with a nine or 10 weight if it's a very large fish. If it's a baby tarpon, uh, and I've only caught small ones. I've only caught tarpon that were up to like 40 pounds. So I've never caught a, a, a you know, 200 pound uh, tarpon. Uh, they do have big ones down in, in uh, Mexico and um, in Florida, um, but they're there at a particular time of year, and I've, I've never been there when they were there. Uh, so he talks about the tarpon flies and all of that. So it's very, uh, you know, he's got a lot of information here. Um, and uh, the other thing is barracuda. I have caught a barracuda. Uh, you have to have a steel tippet. And um, I would tell you that the one that I had was, a, was a, uh, I caught a big one. It was about uh, three and a half feet long, I think, three or four feet long. And uh, it immediately took off, went out about a hundred yards, jumped, 
and it was gone. And I, we brought it back and he had cut right through the steel tippet. So they have uh, very sharp teeth. You don't want to get your hand caught in, in their mouth. Um, then he gets into other gear that you, you could uh, use there. And then he, he gets in some very inform, uh, information I think is fairly useful. You know, just remind you about all the things you have to have uh, when you go to, go to a foreign country, basically. Um, I don't agree with this. He says, you, you know, short or long pants for fishing. Uh, I think that if you're fishing in Mexico or the Bahamas, uh, it, th that sun can be really bad. You need to wear long pants, in my opinion. I think it's very difficult to fish in short pants. My, my grandson, when the first time we went down to uh, um, Mexico, he didn't bring any long pants. And uh, the first day we went out, he had sunburn on his leg so bad, <laughs> he was dying. Uh, and uh, so basically, <laughs> and he's so big that nothing that I have would fit him and uh, his brother, uh, none, of, none, of, none of us have anything that's big enough. So anyway, he, he wound up, I, I think he found a, a pair of uh, long johns or something and he put those on and, and that's what he wore the entire time. But uh, rain jackets, you need those. You need a wide brim hat and, I, and you need a hat that has a, a chin strap. And the reason is because when the boat, when the guides go out, they go out really fast. And if you just have a, you know, a hat on and they're going out that fast, the hat, the hat will blow away. So if you're wearing a, a wide brim hat or a cap, you need, you need something to keep it on your head so it doesn't fly away. Um, wading shoes and booties, he gets into more of that down here. Um, I think if you're wading, you need flat boots because uh, some of the rocks and things that you're going to encounter are sharp and you really need something to protect your feet. And the other thing is uh, they have these neoprene booties that you put on um, and I wear them. And when I wear flat boots, I just put these on. Uh, they're comfortable uh, and so it makes it a lot easier, you know, to, uh, uh, to maneuver, you know, when you're in the water. Um, and he's got a bunch of other things. So anyway, I have this list and uh, I, I'll send it to, uh, um, to Linda and then she can post it and you guys can download it or um, she can send it out to everybody. All right, um, so what, what I thought we would do is talk a little bit about the, uh, start off talking about the things that places that I've been, I mean, I won't talk to tell you about all of them, but at least the, the Bahamas and, uh, and, and Mexico. And um, talk a little bit about the fish that we fish for. Um, and, uh, and then we'd have uh, Clark talk about the Christmas Island trip that he took. And uh, we thought we'd have uh, Rick Rupp talk a little bit about steelhead fishing. Uh, I have been to some places like Alaska and, and Brazil, and if we have time, we can talk about those. Um, if, if Rick Vogel, if you have some, if you, can, if you can just talk a little bit about Belize, I think you've been to Belize, right? Yep. So yep. That, would, that would be good, because I've never been there. Uh, yeah. I actually had a trip planned for the family, and then COVID hit us, and I couldn't, uh, <laughs> we couldn't go. Uh, so this is a tarpon. <clears throat> And I will tell you that the tarpon, uh, everything they, they, that you've heard about tarpon is true. They fight like crazy. They jump out of the water. They are acrobatic. Uh, and, you know, when, when people talk about uh, rainbow trout, you know, kind of do the same thing. But the tarpon being a, a, a much, much, much bigger fish, <laughs> uh, it, um, it, it's pretty exciting. I mean, they, they come out of the water and uh, uh, you really have to um, do the things that they talk about. When they talk about bowing, you have to do that in order to get slack in the line so that, so that, the, uh, so that the fish doesn't break the, uh, you know, the, the line off. And then you've got, uh, where the heck is it? Uh, let's see. This is, I don't know if this is, know, for some reason it's not coming up. Hmm. Well, this is a bonefish. <laughs> uh, the bonefish is like a torpedo. 
and um, or you know it just is unbelievably fast and uh, I think I've caught a hundred bonefish. <laughs> When I go to Mexico, I tell the guide, I really don't want to fish, fish for any more bone fish. I've, I've caught so many of them. And they're, they're, they're a lot of fun to catch because they are, uh, they are strong. They're not that big. But um, I think the biggest one I've caught was seven or eight pounds. But they can take off and um, they don't jump. But they're, you know, they're a great fish, uh, a great game fish. I don't know what happened to the... Well, I had a picture of a... permit, but it's not here. I don't know what happened to it. So anyway, all right. So let me talk to you a little bit about the Bahamas. Um, first time I went down there was probably 25 years ago. We went down with another couple to a, a Long Island and we had some great guides. Uh, we did a lot of um, uh, wading in the flats. Uh, we did some fishing from the boat uh, and what I thought is I do is describe, you know, what the boats are like, you know, the boats basically have a platform in the back where the guide actually will stand and he has a long pole and he's, and once he gets to the area that he wants to fish, he will pole the boat in the area. And whoever, if there's two people on the boat, one, of, one person will be up front and in the front of the boat, there is a platform that is basically set up so that you can cast and uh, safely and hopefully not, not uh, hook the, the guide or your, or your buddy uh, or your wife. Um, but I like getting out of the boat and I like waiting and then finding the fish. And what, what you find out, and this is the first time I went out uh, with a guide, uh, these guys are, um, the, the guides are amazing. They can see fish hundreds of, of yards out coming toward, uh, toward you. And uh, when I first went uh, uh, bone fishing, I said, you know, what are you looking for? You know, how, how do you know that they're, they're fit? Cause you don't, you know, you can't even see them and you don't even know where they are. And he'll say, you know, um, you look for what is called nervous water. I mean, he basically said the water will look like this, you know, way out. And he knows that those are bonefish. And uh, so he'll tell you, you know, bonefish coming at one o'clock. And uh, so, you, you know, he'll position you if you're in a boat or, you know, if you're waiting. And then he'll tell you to wait. And he'll say, wait, wait, wait. And he says, cast. Now, this is where, when we were talking about casting and, and learning how to do the double haul and all the different types of casts that we're talking about, uh, it becomes important when you're fishing for, you know, saltwater fish because you're making longer casts and, Essentially, what you're trying to do is get the cast out 50, 60 feet in front of the fish. And then he just wants you to let it sit there for a while. And he'll say, wait, after you've made your cast. And then as soon as he feels like the fish are going to see the fly that you're using, and normally it's going to be either a shrimp pattern. I'd say a shrimp pattern is probably the most common. You start stripping in slowly. Um, if you're using uh, a streamer that looks like a bait fish, you're stripping in fast because the, it, the, you know, they move actually faster, but shrimp don't move that fast. So basically I'd say most of the guys, you know, that I've ever been with, they're using shrimp patterns. And uh, so you, you start stripping in and lo and behold, one of those fish will peel off or maybe two or three of them will peel off and they'll come and hit that fly. And you can see it hit the fly. So in a way, even though I love trout fishing and I love dry fly fishing, the first time I, I saw that, I thought, okay, this is something that I like doing because you know you can actually see that fish come in and grab that fly. Yeah. And then when you lift up, I mean, the fly will, I mean, the fish will just take off. Me too. And then you see Ken down the bottom? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> can you? Okay. So um, that was a great experience and I got hooked on that and ever since, you know, I've been going to the Bahamas or whatever. Uh, um, Vince Tobia, we, we, a, a friend of mine said, you know, there's a guy that, that sets up trips and they're DIY trips and uh, you want to go. And, you know, at that point, I, I, I'd been fishing saltwater for, for years and, he, and I said, yeah, sure. So he, 
you set it up and basically you go to this place. I can't remember the name of it. I, didn't, I should have looked it up <laughs> anyway. And uh, he, it, you know, and I'll give you Vince's information if you want, but basically you go there and the guy lets you use a car and he tells you exactly, he gives you a map and he tells you exactly where the fish are. And all these places are places that you can actually wait and you can catch bonefish, you can catch tarpon. Uh, I've never seen permit in, uh, in the Bahamas, but tarpon uh, and snook. And uh, so essentially it's a very inexpensive way to fish. Um, I will tell you that um, if you go there uh, in certain times of the year, uh, you really have to have your uh, insect repellent. Um, I, I, I normally use, you know, non-deed insect repellent, but, you know, um, and the reason is that DEET, if you get it on your hands and you get it on the fly line, it will actually crack the fly line. So I, I try to use non-DEET uh, insect repellent and um, hopefully keep the mosquitoes, the mosquitoes away that way uh, because they can be uh, maddening if, uh, if they're around, depending on the time of year that you're going. Um, so the Bahamas, uh, like I said before, I've seen tarpon. I haven't caught a tarpon there. Uh, I've, I've caught a lot of bonefish in the Bahamas. Um, but my new favorite place to fish for salt water is Mexico. Um, the same guy, Vince, told us that um, there was a place in uh, a place called uh, Ishkalak. That's X C A L A K, Ishkalak. Um, and it's on Chetama Bay. So it's on the peninsula from Cancun as you go down, it's about five hours drive. It's on the tip of the peninsula and is, the bay is, you know, south and it goes all the way around. It's a, it's a huge bay. You can see Belize from that town. Belize is on the other side of the bay. And uh, I guess the agreement is that the Mexican guides fish on one side, the Belizean guides fish on the other side, it's the same fish. You know, the fish don't know the borders and so they're all over the place. And uh, there I've seen uh, everything. Huge permit, uh, very, not huge uh, bonefish, but you know, good sized bonefish and, um, and big tarpon. Um, I was there with my grandson and he had a, we had a 10 weight. And we saw a, a tarpon that was uh, in the water and, and you could see the tail. I knew it was a big fish. I figured the fish has got to be, you know, 70, 80 pound tarpon. And he caught it. Um, the, the, the fish was, you know, and the fish is moving and it's hitting the fly and it, it hit the fly and it took the line up so fast it burned his finger. I mean, his finger, he had a mark on his finger where he was, he was stripping it and uh, basically, you know, took off and broke the fly off and it was, you know, the fish was gone. But um, it was exciting for about, you know, three seconds and, and it was a nice experience. But we did catch other, other tarpon, but they were, they were smaller. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't anything like that. Um, so when you go to um, Mexico, um, there is a place called uh, Casa de Coco, um, and that's where Vince sent us. It's an all-inclusive lodge. It's not fancy, but it's all-inclusive. It drinks, food, everything. Uh, they actually will have a van pick you up in Cancun and bring you down, and then pick you up when you're finished and take you back to Cancun. So, I mean, I, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a pretty good well-run operation. Uh, I think the the cost for a week per person is something under three thousand dollars, not including your airfare, and that includes all your food, includes the trip, you know, the the, the van service, and it's a five-hour uh, drive, so it's a long drive. Um, so if you're looking for an all-inclusive type package, that would be it because they they they've got uh, you know good food. Um, they have a uh, happy hour every day where they have, they put out hors d'oeuvres and everything. It's, it's, you know, it, it, it's pretty basic. So, you, you know, it's not one of those places that is luxurious, but, uh, 
the guides that they have um, are good and they'll get you into fish. Um, I don't go there anymore. I, uh, I was talking to the guide, one of the guys that I really liked and I knew the guy that he had, uh, he knew a lot. And um, he had his own boat. Uh, and and uh, I said, is there any, any other places to stay? Um, and he recommended some places. So, I, so I've been going back to other places with, with these guides. And um, I did a trip with my buddies and I, I think it was, uh, including the, the van, something like $1,600 per person. The, the, the guide and all of it. <laughs> so you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta stop along the way and get your own food. But the point is it, it, it winds up and I, I, don't, I personally don't drink a lot. So, you know, for me, the, the drinking part of it didn't, you know, they have unlimited drinking, but I, I don't drink that much. So it doesn't make, didn't make any difference to me. Um, so, you know, basically you get a case of, of beer and sodas and stuff like that. And that's basically uh, all we needed. Um, so I like Mexico and I think it's, uh, it's a great place. And um, for whatever reason, they don't have the, uh, the, 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 the lodges that they have in Belize. I know I was looking into taking my family to Belize and uh, I was thinking about uh, doing a um, Airbnb house um, I think there's more to do in Belize so that if, if, if your members of your family don't fish, they have other things they can do and, and, and you know, while you're fishing and uh, uh, you just have to figure out who the guides are uh, that you want to go, go with and, you know, and book them. But, um, but like I said, I haven't been to a resort, so I, I, I don't know much about that. And I'm, uh, uh, I was thinking that maybe Rick could talk and Rick will talk a little bit about that. Um, at the end of this, uh, at the end of this meeting, so that's it for my discussion. I, I think that. Uh, um, Do you ever fish in Acapulco? Uh, no, I, I haven't. Uh, I caught a uh, 130 pound sailfish. Wow. In Acapulco, there it is. Can you see it? Yeah. Wow. Nice. I was. <laughs> I was. I was senior in high school, and my. Acapulco for my graduation, and I went out on a sail fishing boat. Wow. They uh, they let you reel it in. Uh, if you're the first person to hook the fish, that fish gets to come onto the boat. But if other people catch fish, they put them, they release them. Uh, yeah. Mine just happened to be the first one that. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is actually the one that I caught. That's beautiful. That's when I was a lot younger than I am now. <laughs> I know that uh, I had a friend who actually went uh, uh, tuna fishing in, um, it, it, there's, a, there's a place called Ocean City in, uh, in Maryland, which is about, um, I don't know, uh, three or four hours from, from DC. And, uh, and they went out on a boat and they went tuna fishing with a fly rod. Um, he caught one. One hour later, he told his buddy, "Cut the line." He said, "I can't, he says, I can't take it anymore." He could not get that tuna into the boat. It was so powerful. Uh, the sailfish was very hard to do. Yeah. What they did was they made you go forward and you reel. You go yeah, forward, yeah. Go forward and you reel. And it took me. I think it took me an hour and a half to get it in. Oh boat. God. <laughs> Well, there you go. That's a that's that's a story. I, I mean, they 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 um, they do fly fish for these other fish. Uh, I know that my my grandson has caught a jack, um, a fairly large jack, and but you know these fish can get very large. A jack can get to be 60, 70 pounds, um, and it's very similar to what Clark is going to talk about next because uh, he caught a giant trevally, and. Um, Clark, are you ready to tell us about Christmas Island? Yep. Okay. Set. So what do we do here? Um, hang on, bear with me. Rick has to give you control. Hang on. All right, do you see just me or you see everybody? See everybody. 
Everybody? Okay. Um, I really uh, started a little fly fishing with saltwater um, years and years ago, but only a little bit of it down in Baja, uh, mainly from my small boat and mostly for Dorado or Mahi Mahi. And uh, that's a very fun fish to catch on a like a six or eight weight, depending on the size of the fish. Some of them get big and you need a 10 weight, but it's a lot of fun. A lot of inshore fish you can catch on a fly down there. Um, and and it, forgive me, I'm just going to maybe start more basic a little bit um, about what I perceive is the difference between salt and freshwater. Um, saltwater fishing utilizes bigger gear, bigger flies, easier to tie flies, yeah. easier to uh, see the fish. Um, bigger gear, as long as it's not too heavy, is um, not too burdensome. I was a little a little over a year ago. I went to this Christmas Island trip, and it was a bucket list for for sure. And I'll tell you how I got involved with it. I was fishing up at the San Juan River, and uh, Jeff Massey, the owner of, of uh, Soaring Eagle Lodge, is a friend of mine, and and I went fishing with him up there. And he says, you know, we're putting together a trip to Christmas Island with another uh, outfitter from. Um, Boulder, Colorado, the um, front range angler. So yeah. he co-sponsored this trip and he talked me into going and he'd been before and it truly is a wonderful experience. I had not had any experience with walking the flats. I had to buy a whole bunch of gear. I had to get the airline ticket. I got a buddy of mine in San Diego Then we, we went over together. Basically, um, Christmas Island is three hours by jet south of Hawaii, just north of the equator. It's a it's the uh, Republic of Kiribati, and um, frequently called Christmas Island. Um, let me show you a few pictures. Uh, and I don't know if anybody here is interested in going, but I would go again in a minute. <laughs> Whether you catch a giant trevally or not, I would do this trip again. Was it a 12 weight rod? What's that? 12 weight rod. I had biggest rod I have is 11 weight. 11 weight, okay. I know uh, Jeff. I know Jeff, and I uh, I fished with him several times, so I just uh, just wondered about it. Um. Okay, so let's do this. Do you see that? No. Uh, I need to share a screen, I guess. Yeah. Oh, there, there you go. How's that? Yep. This is flying in from Honolulu, and it's one flight a week, wow. and it's flying into the Republic of Kiribati. It's three hours. Um, the island, as I can tell, is probably at least the size of Maui. It's a it's a big island, and yet none of it's more than five feet above sea level. And the entire thing is an atoll, and you can see here below, on over here on the lower right, you've got a significant amount of land. So, but all the rest is only available by boat. It's a huge, huge island. And here's the airport, not much. Here's, here's an overview of the island. And if you look at this, this is the Pacific Ocean and all around it is Pacific Ocean, of course. And here is the only real significant inlet into the all of these flats, all these, this patchwork here that you see, all these are fishing flats and you probably got, here's, uh, here's five miles. See over here, zero to five. That's that. Yeah. So you got like 50 miles and nobody's around. 
and it's beautiful water loaded with fish if you want to do saltwater fishing outside this lagoon area you go out through here and catch tuna and if you want to go do that stuff there's all kinds of fish out there um here's a map here here here's hawaii way up here here's Kir Kirtamati, right here, Christmas Island, just north of the equator. Bunch of other islands around. Um, during the war, World War II, um, a couple of bases here. People are very friendly. They're very um, poor. And if you go, don't expect a first class hotel, but expect kind people, wonderful guides, and a lot of fish. Here's a typical room. This is our room. My buddy and I, pretty simple, but clean, cleaned every day. Here's a group of the guys. One gal was here and this is the dinner arrangement here. Wonderful food, fairly simple, drinks and all that if you want it. Here's some flies. Um, down here in the lower part, you've got a couple of, only a couple of uh, larger flies that you might throw to, for a GT or something. These are typical Christmas Island uh, bonefish flies here in the middle. Here's some crab flies. And here are a couple of poppers. More, you got flies coming out the wazoo because you need to make sure you're prepared because there's not a fly shop around. I probably had to spend, I don't know, probably 200 bucks on flies just to go to the trip. Some poppers. These are probably five inches long. Wonderful for surface. Uh, I talked a couple of weeks ago on terrestrials and I just love top water fishing in general. You throw these things in anything. There's such a mixture of fish there that anything can come up and grab these things. This thing here is about eight, 10 inches long. And I'll show you the picture of, here's some crabs, uh, pretty small. Christmas Island uh, bonefish flies here. There's another fish there called Triggerfish. Um, before we get to triggerfish, <laughs> all the water looks like this. Crystal clear, of course. There's no pollution. It's just tranquil. It's, it's, it's really a beautiful place. Just don't expect five-star accommodations. But I didn't. And you don't. You go in to go fishing. Typical um, beach here where they take you out in a boat, uh, probably four in a boat with two guides typically. And the particular place I stayed at is called the Akari House. You know, if anybody wants to know about it, I can forward you the info. Um, the Akari House has is unique there on, on Christmas Island because they've got boats that you'd find similar in Florida or the Caribbean in that it's a center console or they are a center console, 140 horse motors and get you out there quickly, drop you off with a guide and you're walking the flats and they know these flats. It's unbelievable how they get into some of these places um, because there's no markers there. You know, you, <laughs> there's, there's no markers. There's no, um warnings for a, a shallow shoal or anything like that but all the guides know and the boatmen know how to get to these far away lagoons um here we are having gotten off the boat and this is just typical just dry rugged land it, they do get rain there some but it's all volcanic um and so there's not a lot of plant growth, although there are some beautiful frigate birds that nest there and so forth. 
guides, I think Dean talked about a little bit, guides can see fish, whether you got the right glasses and you got 20-20 vision or not, which I do with prescriptions. I, and, yeah, I, these guys see fish, Dean said, you know, 100 yards away, um, in the water, not on the surface, not a tail, but under the surface. You got shallow water here, you probably got two or three feet of water all the way out here where the light color is. And their bonefish are on there and a guide will be able to see them. Many times a guide would say cast uh, one o'clock, uh, 40 feet. Well, I still didn't see anything, but he put me on a fish. Um, while you're bone fishing or whatever other smaller fish you're fishing for, the guide is carrying your 12 weight and he's carrying a 12 weight rigged up, ready to go to throw at a giant trevally if he comes cruising through. There's a typical bonefish. The bonefish there are quite, they're, they're hefty and they are a kick to catch, of course. Um, they'll spool 7,500 yards of line off uh, with no trouble. Here's a trigger fish I talked about. These are a lot of fun to catch, spooky, uh, very hard to uh, get them to take. They would typically take a crab pattern. They get very big. This is not a very big one. This is called a mustache trigger. They're beautiful fish. They're strong. They're spooky. And as an, a, a diversion from bonefish that can get tiring, <laughs> uh, they're a lot of fun and, and, and difficult to catch. Why do you call them spooky? Why do you call them trigger? Is that what... Why do you call them spooky? I, you're, I can, you're breaking up there, Judith. Why'd you call them spooky, Clark? Oh, spooky, spooky. Um, you throw a... They, they eat with their mouth down and they're chomping. See those teeth? They're chomping on coral and their tail is up in the air, sometimes breaking the surface. I'm getting to the word spooky in a minute here. <laughs> um, just like a big brown trout or even as a, a lot of trout, are very, very spooky. A lot like a permit. Yeah, certainly a permit. A lot of fish are spooky. They're spooky of what? They're spooky of seeing you for one thing. They're spooky of uh, graveling on the bottom if you're not careful when you're wading in a stream or a river that's the case here also um you don't want to be making a lot of noise because if a fish is 200 feet away from you they are not they're going to lay low and not eat until everything quiets down the biggest issue i found with trigger fish and to some extent bonefish certainly permit too when you throw a fly out there uh you don't want to throw it near the fish because something coming into the water and dropping is unusual for these fish. Nothing's dropping into the water other than rain here. So if you drop, throw a fly, more than, I, I would guess, more than 20 feet away from this trigger fish and most bonefish, they're not gonna eat your fly because something just plopped in the water. Um, so you've gotta lead the fish, you gotta know what direction that fish is headed and hope he keeps heading that way so you can present your fly by the time he gets there, then you start stripping. You, you move the fly a little bit, get the fish's attention, and that's what we mean by spooky, okay? Um, at least when it comes to saltwater, reef fish. Now let's talk a little bit about clothing uh, while we got this picture. That's a waterproof, uh, sling bag that has a lot of stuff in it that I carried. Uh, it's not too heavy. It's not in the way. It's waterproof, costs a couple hundred bucks. Here's some leggings, which I was told by Jeff Messy that it'd be a good idea to have leggings uh, instead of, here's our guide over here. Um, sometimes, you know, you these are a little protective um, and they go all the way up to your waist. These are flats boots, regular shorts. 
long sleeve UV shirt, of course, uh, all kinds of stuff to protect your hands and face from burning sun. Um, why leggings? Um, sometimes walking through the water uh, is easier when you're when it's these leggings are really tight. Um, and half the guys wore them. And I, I'd never worn these uh, fishing in rivers, but in this kind of water, in this kind of environment, I would suggest spending 40 bucks and, you know, having them. This is what an 11 weight rod looks like when he's tied onto a giant trevally. Giant trevally are, are just vociferous fish. They are very, they're marauders of the flats. No matter where you fish for a giant trevally, they are crushing anything that they see and could get in their large mouth. So let me tell you a little bit, I, I don't wanna bore you with a fishing story, but it, it's worthy of telling, I think, because it taught me something. We're fishing this area, um, Actually, we had just gotten off the boat. Um, and probably 200 yards away, I could see 200 yards at least. I could see in, in, the, in a lagoon, not even the lagoon we were fishing, I could see a bunch of jumping bait fish. Well, when I see that, um, I, and, and it was our first day fishing, I said, do I wanna tell my guide that I saw this over there and it was a couple hundred yards away, but there were a bunch of jumping bait fish. He was very interested in knowing that and wanted to point where it was. We hauled over there and he started throwing my 11 weight just blindly trying to see if there were, cause he knew better than I did that that probably meant there was a giant trevally in that area. So half an hour later, we're standing on a beach fishing for bonefish, and he's continuing to look like he should for this giant trevally that might, or any giant, any big fish in there. He's got my 11 weights, and he's like this close to me, like six feet away. I'm fishing for bonefish, and coming down the beach, like in this picture here, like in, right along the edge here probably, maybe 50, 75 yards away, this big fish is coming right along the beach towards us. He hands me the 11 weight because he knows what that is. <laughs> I'm not very skillful, <laughs> but I could flop out this, um, this fly. That's the fly. It's actually the fly. Um, I could flip it out 30 feet. I only had Here's the key thing. You don't have much time. You see a giant trevally, you've got to get the rod in your hand quickly. You've got to, you've got to have it ready to go. You've got to get a little line out. Luckily, I got enough line out and flopped it out about 30 feet, kind of in front of the nose of this giant trevally. And he took that fly and just took off. He was gone. I mean, out in deep water. And here's my backing. Here's the, here's the reel. And here's, here's a, this is a, like a 11, 12 weight reel compared to a, um, a five weight reel. Mm. Um, this is, um, uh, 80 pound hatch backing. Um, he didn't almost spool me, but I bet I didn't have an awful lot left. Here's the fish. Well, it, they have huge mouths. It, it's a great fish. Um, this is the one I told you a couple of weeks ago. It took at least 20 minutes to revive him because um, he had swallowed the hook. Here's my friend holding the same fish. I don't know what he weighed. Uh, it, uh, yeah. Here's from the beach at, um, at the Akari house um, that very next day, I think. So stop share. 
Um, what else? A lot of a, a lot of saltwater fishing I find uh, I think Dean this is true probably is sight fishing and I you know yeah. it's a lot different than nymph fishing assuming there might be a fish down there and you you know so I like sight fishing you can sight fish for large rainbows if you're in the right place um, and I like it um, and what else. Um, One of the things that I, I wondered about, I, I know Jeff and, um, uh, you know, I, I actually wanted to go there, uh, I guess, this this past year. And he said you can't come here because New Mexico is shut down right now. But anyway, uh, they just reopened. No, New Mexico is open. Yeah, it's, it's open now. Uh, but it was when I when I called him, I was thinking about going and uh, he said you, you really can't come now because it, it was last year and it, it was just the whole state was shut down. But um, he, he runs these trips. Can you tell us what what the uh, what he charges for the for the week? Well, it's interesting. Not, not counting the, the airfare and all that. Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought that up. You can go to uh, uh, yeah, to answer your question. Uh, he and Front Range Anglers didn't mark the trip up at all. I think uh, for a week at the Akari House and other places, there's only two or three other places there, and. Mm -hmm. um, Christmas Island. I think it's 1800 bucks per angler per week. And that's all inclusive, except for beer and wine. That includes guides. If you want to tip a guide 10 bucks a day instead of 100, that's good money to those people. And they're excellent guides. So it's a reasonable trip once you get there cost wise. Um, there's a lot of outfitters that do trips all over the world, many of them to Christmas Island, you go to the Seychelles, you can go to Costa Rica, you, you know, Belize. You, 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 don't, you can do this on your own, but there are a lot of places that don't upcharge and they have it all done, um, uh, all arranged, uh, very easy to work with. Uh, Jeff, by the way, is planning, I'm trying to put together a trip to Patagonia um, and I'm interested in going down there uh, mm -hmm. for trout. Um, I'd go back to Christmas Island. Anybody here uh, want to go? Let me know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm interested. <laughs> yeah. It's honestly, it's. Great. I, had a buddy, I had a buddy that went there, and he and he, he never caught it. He he hooked one, but he it broke him off, and uh, he never landed a giant trout again. Uh, I was, so I, that was, to be, that to was be honest, that was great. I, I think we had uh, 20 people there that week, which is all the. Uh, the Akari house can handle. And I think there were eight GTs caught and we well, fished every day. So well, I was very great. lucky. I really was. I, I, I don't profess to be able to go out there and get another one, but people who go there three or four times don't get any GTs. But the, the nice thing about it is there, the variety of the fish, if you get tired of bone fish, go for trigger fish. There are other fish called the blue trevally which is a smaller trevally. It's not, um, I don't know, he's, they're two feet long. They're barracuda. Buddy of mine caught, oh, geez, a four and a half foot barracuda. And yeah. I was standing in the water about three feet deep. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this torpedo, huge barracuda, went swimming past me, chasing some kind of bait fish right by my legs. And this thing was huge and he was there and he was gone. It's just yeah. an exciting place for a variety of different fish. I, what what but, time of the year were you there? I was there j j a little over a year ago, January of 2020, just before COVID. Yeah. Um, I would go, you know, no bugs. There weren't any mosquitoes. Um, I don't know if that's typical. Uh, rain one night, that's it. Uh, wind blew one day or something, made it casting difficult. Um, I'm sure other times it's it's windy. Um, uh, it's just a very interesting place. Wonderful people, great guides. I know it's been closed though uh, since um, at least March, maybe February. Mm -hmm. So we were one of the last trips in there. Um, as far as far as the Akari house goes, I am not certain they're open yet. 
There's another place there called the Villages, which is probably equally as good. And I, I'm sure they are open. You can follow these people on Instagram. You can look it up uh, on the website. If somebody wants the, um, I'll spell the Akari House if anybody's interested. I-K-A-R-I, Akari House. And the other place is the Villages. Okay, um, I think I bored everybody enough. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's great, Rick. Uh, thank you. It's great. Now, who, who's it? We're well, handing Rick off. Clark, I mean. <laughs> I'm getting Rick on the mind. <laughs> Rick Rupp was going to talk a little bit about steelhead because he's done a lot of steelhead fishing, and we thought that, uh, you know, that's a that's a, a, a sea-run rainbow, basically, and they, they have them in... Uh, Washington, Oregon, all over, uh, New York, Canada. Um, so Rick Rupp, you want to talk a little bit about your experience with that? And I think you use a, a spay rod, correct? You're muted. <laughs> You're muted, Rick. He doesn't know it. Uh... I didn't know it, but I'm back on. <laughs> oh, yeah, there you are. <laughs> I just wanted to thank you both for your for your presentations. Clark, your photography was great, uh, and it, it was. It was very nicely done, and uh, and it was a, a fine presentation. Pretty exciting place, Christmas Island. I think it's got some, it uh, intrigued me for sure, as I suspect it did others. So uh, we've been talking about uh, saltwater fish, and, uh, and I don't know how many of you have any familiarity with steelhead, but uh, they're, uh, they are sometimes a saltwater fish. They're called an anadromous fish. And, uh, and like a salmon, uh, it, which is also an anadromous fish. And it's, what it means is that they were born and raised in freshwater at a point in time in life. They've traveled to the ocean and spent time in the ocean and come back. Uh, it's, it's an amazing journey that these fish go through. And uh, it's a, quite a story. And, and I'm a Northwestern guy. I've fished steelhead around the Northwest and, and British Columbia. And, uh, uh, and there, those, those fish journey of 400 to 800 miles from the inlands of, uh, inland of Idaho and the Salmon River and the Snake River and the Grand Ronde. And, and they go through eight dams uh, on their journey out. And they, they the first uh, back up and just say the first part of their lives are spent uh, where they are born on those river systems, and they they are in that fresh water for two or three years, getting to six inches or so in size, being called smolt, and then they get this uh, this call to go to the ocean. An amazing thing about this ocean trip is. They go to the ocean, those four or 600 miles down the river to the ocean, they go down backwards. Their head is up water and they let the rivers push them down to the ocean. Of course, when they get into the slack water of the dams, which kill a tremendous amount of these fish, 90 some percent of them are, are, are killed by the dams. Uh, they get into the warm slack water and they don't know really how to get out of it. So anyway, it's a, it's a perilous journey for these fish going down to the ocean. But once they finally get to, to the salt water, they, they have a metamorphosis take place where they change from breathing oxygen out of uh, fresh water into being able to breathe in salt water. So it's a, it's a physical feat that they go through just to get to the ocean and then be able to uh, live in the ocean. So they travel the ocean from one to three or four years, uh, and, it, and it varies from species of, uh, of uh, steelhead and salmon. And they spend that time out there. And when they hit the ocean, it's like at, uh, these fish at the mouth of the Columbia and the Pacific, they typically head north towards Alaska, out along the Aleutians, and head towards Russia and Japan. And depending on how long they're out there, they turn around and come back. So they enter the water six and eight inches long, and they come back uh, somewhere between. Oh, excuse me. 
uh, they uh, come back in, in uh, depending on how long they're out there, of course, in different sizes, but a, a typical steelhead will come back. He'll be in the 12, 14 pound range, can go as high as 40 pounds. Wow. Uh, so it's, it's a, but one of the, the part that I've, that I'm missing is when they come back from the ocean and enter freshwater, once again, they have to learn how to breathe in fresh water. So their system goes through another metamorphosis to breathe in fresh water. When they hit fresh water, they basically stop eating. Uh, salmon, uh, the salmon's stomach actually, when it hits fresh water, basically uh, seals up and they no longer eat for food. They do strike baits, uh, but they, they, uh, they're living on the fat of their body until they hit the spawning grounds. And, and they just conserve energy long enough to get up there, however far it is, they go upstream to their, and their spawning grounds. They always return to where they were born. Uh, they'll return within 15 feet of where they were born. Uh, it's, a, it's an amazing story what these fish go through. The steelhead, uh, the salmon is a different species and the steelhead as Dean mentioned is an ocean going rainbow trout. When it comes back to the fresh water, it does not, it does not eat until it spawns or eats very little, but it, once it spawns, if it is healthy enough and strong enough, it will go back to the ocean again. Uh, so these fish, if you're uh, like you're looking at steelhead in a coastal stream, uh, or like the Skeena River system up in British Columbia, those fish can come in and spawn and turn around and go back. So they can live multiple years and get to be and make three or four returns. So they get to be very, very big fish. And I'll show you some pictures of some of those fish uh, in, in just a moment. So salmon and steelhead are different, but they are both anadromous fish. Uh, and that gives you a little idea of, of what their, uh, their life cycle looks like. Steelhead fishing is really a much different sport than the saltwater fishing that we've uh, been listening to or trout fishing in general. It's a, it's, it's a, a fish of a thousand cast. If you are a steelhead fisherman and you catch one steelhead a day, you are having a lot of success because steelhead fishing, you can fish all day and, and uh, not catch a fish for three or four days in a row. It's a, it's a difficult fish to catch. Uh, and, it's, and it's also, uh, uh, I'm losing the train of thought there with that fish, but the, the the steelhead are very light sensitive fish. So you basically start your day fishing an hour before daylight and you fish an hour into the darkness. Uh, and that's the prime time for the fish. If it's a clear sunny day, it is typically not a day to stay out and fish. And again, uh, when you are steelhead fishing with a fly rod, like we're talking about, uh, you're typically waiting, you would not be in a boat. And so it becomes, uh, and you'll, you'll enter the water and fish uh, up to your waist. And when you're in that water and you're using a spay casting rod, which is a two handed rod uh, with a, a very unusual, but very artistic kind of a cast, uh, when you're doing that, you're throwing your line 80 to maybe 120 feet. And so you're not fishing next to your buddy. You typically uh, go into a steelhead run and you're basically there by yourself. Most of the time you will not see anybody around you because you have to fish where these runs are and that's where the fish are. So you'll be in that run for maybe, you'll start and you'll be in that same run You'll make a cast, you'll walk about three or four feet and you'll make another cast. And you'll be in that run for maybe three hours before you get through the whole run. And you may or may not 
hit a fish. Uh, steelheads strike very hard, very strong, normally hook themselves. But when you've been fishing for two hours and you've already made 200 casts and all of a sudden you hit a fish, well, you're, you, <laughs> you, you know, you, you might be a little bit uh, not ready for it. So it's a very rude awakening and it's a, they call it tug love if you're a steelheader when you get that tug. And it's a, it's a very exciting time, very strong fish. They, they come up the ocean through all those dams. It's hard to imagine that they could be that strong, but they hit just like uh, and run just like uh, you're talking about with all of these other saltwater fish. Uh, if you catch a big fish, you'll have him on for 15 or 20 minutes. A larger fish, uh, I've had a fish on for an hour. Wow. So it's a, it's very, it's a very exciting fishing, but it's not, a, you're not going to go out. Uh, the largest day I've had is I had 10 fish one day in British Columbia. Uh, but it's a, it's a one, one fish day and is kind of the way it goes. So if you're looking for lots of, of uh, steelhead to catch, uh, you're, you ought to go back to the, to the bonefish <laughs> and the trout. Yeah, I, when you are fishing for these fish, it's typically a swing kind of fishing. You're using a, a long rod. These rods will run basically between sevens and nine weights rods, and they're going to be in the 13 to 14 and a half feet long. Uh, you'll be using a weighted kind of a line called a skagit line, and you typically uh, throw it out a little downstream of parallel or perpendicular from your position. Uh, you'll make a heavy mend and, and set that fly down and then you'll follow it down with your rod tip. So it's uh, a cast may take you three or four minutes once it hits the water before it swings through the whole seam that you're fishing. Uh, so it's a lot of work to be a steelhead fisherman and uh, the people that do it like I do, it's, it's the fishing that's exciting, but you're in the water all by yourself most of the day. <coughs> in, uh, <laughs> excuse us. <laughs> and and uh, you have to be uh, into just enjoying the elements that you're out there. And, you know, there's always the, the eagles, the otters, the beaver, uh, we had a property on the Lower Snake River in south of Lewiston and it had lots of bighorn sheep and you know, bighorn sheep would come down and stand along the water and watch you. Uh, <laughs> so it's that kind of beauty uh, that goes along with uh, maybe catching a steelhead. Okay. Uh, so uh, I've got a couple of pictures uh, that I can put up there. I think I've covered, uh, I, I, let me get back to the season a little bit. Uh, when I lived in uh, Bend, Oregon, I fished the Deschutes quite a bit and we could start fishing for steelhead in the Deschutes River. They come up the Columbian through two dams to get to the Deschutes. And we would start fishing about the third week of July. And, and the, uh, the daytime temperatures on the Deschutes River will be in the, easily in the 90s, sometimes in the 100 degree days, very, very hot during the day. We don't fish during the day. We fish the mornings and the evenings. Uh, and it's, uh, but you could fish that season from July until after the first of the year, right through the winter. I've fished them when the water's been like 40, 34, 36 degrees, snow on the ground, uh, cold as could be. Water was warmer than the air temperature and, and still catch fish. Uh, it's a, an incredible thing. It's a little different when you get over in the Lewiston area where it's really fairly mild winters, uh, but the season over there waits until the water temperatures come down because it's warm over there and the water temperatures can get into the lower to mid 70s. The fish will not travel, the fish will not strike. Uh, they'll find a cold water coming in from a stream and they'll hang there before they move upstream further. Uh, 
anyway, it's a, it's a lot of fun, very solitaire kind of environment, though. You're not going out there with 40, four or five guys and hanging there. Uh, we did have a boat in the, on the Lower Snake River south of Lewiston, and we could get in this, our jet boat and go upstream uh, 60 miles to 80 miles to the Hell's Canyon Dam. Uh, it's not charted waters. You have to learn it from somebody that understands how to get up and down these, mm. these, uh, these rivers. Uh, those rivers are dam controlled, so the dams change their water flows all the time. So water, uh, typically on the lower snake, we would fish a big river. It's probably 300 yards wide. And our fishing season, our, our, the flow of the, of the water when we fish could be as low as 12,000 CFS, could be as high as 30,000 CFS. Uh, wow. And... Uh, it just changes all the time. It's a, it's pretty incredible. Um, so I hey, don't Rick? know what I've spent for time, but I'm going to. Rick? Yes. Rick? Um, you might explain CFS. I don't know if we've uh, talked about that. Yeah, I'm academy. sorry. It's uh, cubic feet per second. Uh, a lot of trout streams. Uh, we lived in Jackson Hole. We'd go s to small trout streams and <laughs> it'd be uh, 250. Uh, 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 very, very low flow streams. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the, uh, the lower Snake River and all those major rivers over there have huge flow differences. Uh, in the spring runoff, when we were used to fishing in 15,000 or 30,000 CFS, uh, in the spring, the runoff, that river would get up to 180,000 Wow. cubic feet per second just unbelievable differences in the it's snake unfishable. river excuse yeah. me, the salmon river which doesn't have any dams on it during the summer is running like at 3500 cfs and and if it the conditions are right it can go to 90,000 cfs wow 3000 it's so it's it can be very treacherous water from a boating standpoint uh not you know, when the water's that high, obviously you're not out fishing. So, yeah. uh, you're just well. Even the San Juan uh, in the spring, I think it's May. They they re the, the dam starts to release water, and um, I, I think you know it's it becomes dangerous. I mean, I, I I don't even like to be there when when that happens because you can't wait it. It's just uh, you know the, the the current is too powerful and uh, and too dangerous, and right. uh, so. Um, I, I think whenever they do that kind of stuff and the dams are, uh, you know, they do that quite often because they have to release water also during the summer for the farmers downstream. And, uh, and so you, you wind up having situations where it could be, you know, it could be uh, dangerous, so. So all of the Northwest, basically every, every river up through there that had a connection to the ocean had salmon and steelhead in it yeah. at the time. Uh, they're really tremendous fish. It's a, it's a great, story, uh, learning about those fish. Uh, you get a lot of connections with the Native American tribes because all of the tribes in the Northwest lived on fish, had spiritual connection to the fish that was their culture. Uh, it's, uh, so there's a, a lot of great stories about steelhead and salmon if you get closer to it, especially in the Northwest, Alaska and Canada. A little different east when you you go to Lake Erie or Lake Michigan where they do have a very nice steelhead populations, but it tends not to be a fly fishing uh, situation. Most of it is some sort of uh, spin fishing or level lines. There is fly okay. fishing in the Maritimes that uh, on all the way to the East Coast, uh, Nova Scotia, uh, New Brunswick, those places have fly fishing in rivers for Atlantic salmon. Sammy. Great presentation, but I, pardon me? Great presentation, but I have to run. All right, Joe, thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Toodaloo. So here's, I'll just screen share for a second and uh, hopefully uh, show you some, uh, just a couple of pictures. Oops. Oops. Okay, uh, here's, here are what typical steelhead flies would look like. 
I'm mm -hmm. not a I'm not a, a fly tire for trout. You know, trout is kind of a match the hatch kind of thing. Steelhead strike things because of irritation, curiosity, everything but eating. And so they, I, I've stood on a river and watched a fly go past a steelhead five times. He'll move off the side and let it go by. He sees it. It, it looks like he could care less. The sixth time it goes by, he dashes out and hammers it. I mean, you just, there's no rhyme or reason to this. Uh, they've done studies on them where they've watched them go up and pick off leaves that are floating down the, floating down the river. So, uh, but in different areas, different colors seem to work best. These are colors. These are, this bottom fly is a, uh, seeing that okay, folks? Are you seeing these flies okay? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, this bottom one is a is what they would call a stinger. It has a trailing hook that you can see here. It's a color like no fly you've ever seen before, but it works. Uh, these flies work uh, well over uh, on the clear water in the winter when the water is cold. Also, there are specialized flies for uh, fishing over in Russia at Kamchatka. Uh, of course, this is a fixed hook kind of a fly, and you can use uh, smaller flies for uh, for steelhead. You can use you can use different kinds of uh, dry flies for steelhead. There's a lot of popularity with dry fly fishing for steelheads. Very exciting. Very different. Most people are subsurface. Uh, those are a couple kinds of flies. Uh, here is a uh, a 40 inch uh, steelhead. Wow caught in the Clearwater River. It was Christmas Eve uh, <laughs> uh, around Lenore, which is up between Lewiston and Orofino. That is a spay rod there. You can see it's a two-handed rod and uh, it has actually a little blue fly in its mouth. Two hands. Oh. Naturally, that two-handed one would fall in that one. Yeah, get rid of that, <gasps> that guy. Here's another large fish. This is a 38 inch, uh, and you can see the colors are different. You can see the rainbow in that fish. The, the person that caught this is a retired uh, Idaho fishing game person and a, an excellent photographer. So that's, those are, those are, uh, let, me, let me say that these are called B-run steelhead. Uh, there's typically two different designations of fish. The A-run fish are the ones that go to the ocean for a shorter period of time. A B-run is, a, is a, a fish. It's a different, little different species of steelhead, or uh, that's not quite the right term. But anyway, it's, uh, it stays in the ocean for a couple more years and comes back a much larger fish. Wow. So just beautiful, magnificent kinds of fish. Uh, here is, of course, I'm kind of like Dean. It's all big fish, you know. <laughs> but this big is big male. Yeah, this is this is on the Lower Snake River. This is just upriver uh, from where our ranch property was. We used to go up here all the time to fish uh, steelhead in our boat, and we'd pull in there and have a, a great time of it. That's a very unusual fish. It's a very large fish, like the ones you've already seen. This is another retired uh, fishing game person that actually had uh, come down to show me how to run the boat up and down the river. Mm -hmm. And that was, uh, that fish was around Thanksgiving of that year. Uh, this is a fish uh, from uh, British Columbia. It's up on the Kispiox River. Uh, you can see just the colors. You can see the body mass. Uh, much the fish up there have a lot of body mass. They have uh, really no dams to go through. They come in from the ocean. Uh, they're just big, strong, healthy fish. Uh, British Columbia is, is a, a great place to go to fish. Uh, this is a monster. This is a, this is a fish that I caught uh, on the Balkley, which flows uh, 
and the kiss gods kind of flow in the same direction around uh, going into the Skeena drainage system. This was the largest fish caught in this lodge in 33 years. It was 44, 44 inches in length, but at a 23 inch girth. Whoa. Incredible. <laughs> it's over 40 pounds, this fish. <laughs> and, this, wow. they, and it was estimated that I was with the, uh, the owner of the, of the guide shop. Uh, we were out together fishing, uh, and uh, it was the largest fish that he had ever seen caught up there. And, uh, and he estimated that this fish was probably eight years old. Mm -hmm. And so it, it had gone back to the ocean several times. Mm -hmm. so, pretty incredible. Uh, that happened to be a, a one of my best days. Uh, I had a ten day fish. Uh, wow. There. Uh, and just uh, this is a a picture of me. This is on uh, uh, the Kalama Kalama River in Terrace, BC. It's kind of a river goes into the Skeena drainage. You can see that line. It's not the neatest of cast, but it's my skill level, not, not anything to do with the rod or the line. Looks pretty good uh, to me. You see, it's uh, you can see how it kind of goes out there and you can see that it's gonna go a long way. Uh, but it, this was also in the spring of the year, the water was ice cold, lots of snow. It was, uh, and the fishing was actually pretty terrible. Mm. So right. if I had, uh, been as prepared as, as Clark, I would have had some maps of showing you where are these fish travel and all that, but that can be done at another time if anybody has an interest. Well, don't you want to keep those kind of things secret, Rick? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, these fish, they fish, these fish are not like uh, the salmon and the steelhead are, are not in there to eat. So they're in there to go spawn. So they have their ways of following and they'll they, you know, when they've left as small six and eight inch smolt and have gone to the ocean, they come back, these big fish, they're coming back like they've, you know, they've only been, they went by that rock going out and they came back to that rock, but the, the, the steelhead and the salmon will hit the same spots all the time. And it's the first time they've ever been there. They just, if you get to know the runs in the, in the river and the way the fish work up and down the river, then you have a good chance of getting in front of one of them. Oh, so Rick. Yes, sir. A uh, question. Um, sometimes do you fish those same rivers for other species of trout, like, uh, like rainbow other times of the year, or are you strictly a steelhead fisherman? Cause uh, there, there have to be, I would guess there's rainbows and browns in there too. Uh, not, Typically, oh. uh, I, I have, I, I started out as a trout fisherman in Jackson Hole uh, years ago, but uh, uh, when I got into steelhead fishing, it kind of captured my life. This, uh, I don't know, uh, are you seeing my desktop there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's actually part of this ranch property that we owned. Where this thing says steelhead photos is actually where we had a, a house and uh, right, well, I should say it was the house is more like here and there's a big lagoon here where we could keep our boat. But you can see from this, from this little bit right there that I've got is it's very arid. It's very hot in the summers. Uh, this lower uh, salmon river uh, that uh, is very good for steelhead in the summer is almost sterile. The water gets way, way hot, like Riggins, Idaho. Maybe you've heard of that town, but it's a big steelhead and salmon town. But during the summers, it gets over 100 degrees in that town. Uh, so that the when there aren't steelhead in here, there, there's some sturgeon, but there'll be smallmouth bass, <clears throat> lots of smallmouth bass. Go further upstream, and you can get into the rivers that come out of the northeastern Oregon. The Grand Ron is a beautiful river, the, um, the Wallawa, the Lowstein, the Minam, uh, those rivers are cooler rivers all year round and they do have trout in them. But just for a perspective- I have no idea that water was that warm there. Pardon? Yeah, so from a perspective yeah. standpoint where this property is, 
of ours, we're 10 miles south of Lewiston, Idaho, where the Clearwater comes in, and upstream is going to the right, and we go up there about uh, 30 miles, and that's where the Salmon River comes in. It's like 400 miles yet around there to get to the Redfish Lake, where uh, the, the sockeye and all the salmon go back to. So uh, when people talk about getting fish back, they're talking about getting more fish into those very uh, pristine waters, cold waters, uh, for salmon and steelhead to spawn and go back out. And that's, uh, I, I'm very engaged with the uh, controversy that's been going on for 40 years about the, the dams, the Lower Snake River, extinction of species of salmon and orcas. Uh, it's, a, it's a hell of a mess up there, but it's uh, a representative, Mike Simpson's got a program underway that possibly if the Northwest will get its act together, we'll uh, work on it and get it done. And I, I see Rick Vogel with a little smile on his face. I think he's got some understanding of what I'm talking about. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Rick, Ruff, we're going to need to wrap this up soon. We're, we got about yep. our, I, I can um, I can stop right and there. And thank you all for being That here. was great. Yeah, yeah good job there, Rick. I mean, I <laughs> very enlightening. Thank you very much for that. Um, while we have a few minutes, I, I think uh, Rick Vogel, can, can you just talk a little bit about Belize? You, you've been there, haven't you? You said? Yeah, I can, and I'll keep it to five minutes because I know everybody's yawning like yeah. me, and it's been a long day and everything. So, um, yeah, um, my wife and I, for people who know me, we go to a lot of crazy places in the a world. A lot of places. Um, <laughs> I got to tell you, Belize is on the opposite end of the spectrum. If you guys want to take your family, your, your kids, your grandkids to a great place, Belize is definitely it. As a destination resort for strictly fly fishing, I don't know that I would do it um, mm -hmm. just for that. There's a lot of lodges there. Um, if you want to write down, it's it, where you want to go is Ambergris K. It's uh, A-M-B-E-R-G-R-I-S-K-A-Y-E. Um, it's out of Belize. You fly into Belize City from Houston, and then it's a puddle jumper flight over to Ambergris. Belize has the second biggest barrier reef in the world. That's primarily why I went there with my daughter and, and wife and a, my daughter's friend on spring break to scuba dive. Um, I dove twice every day. Um, in between, I got some bonefish fishing done. Uh, I couldn't find any places that were weightable. Um, standing on a, on a skiff for four or five hours is really tough, as these guys will tell you. Waiting yeah. is much easier to do on your body, especially now at our age. The bone fishing is, is, is a hoot. Um, there are um, tarpon there. Uh, when I went in, in March, uh, one year, about 10 years ago, a hurricane the fall before had blown them down into Honduras, so I didn't see any. Uh, when I made one cast, I accidentally got into a school of permit. They don't see many there. And I actually hooked one by accident. The guide was shocked that he saw that big a school. Uh, it was my first experience at bone fishing. And as these guys will tell you, even a small bone fish, it will spool you so fast that if your fingers on that line, you won't have one left. It was blew me away. I never saw a fish spool me like that, except for a red cider on the Deschutes. It, yeah. uh, it's a kick. But um, we stayed at a place called Victoria House, and it's a magnificent place, one of the nicest places I've ever stayed. I had a workmate who went there on his honeymoon, told me about it. We went there a few years later. Uh, my daughter liked it so much, she went on her honeymoon about five years after that there. Uh, it's a, it's a, Ambergris is a place where there's no cars. You drive golf carts everywhere to get places or a boat. There's archeological sites in the area you can take a boat to. I think they have golfing, I didn't golf. Um, the food was magnificent. Uh, it's very safe. Uh, just, just a fun place. I'd look it up on the internet, Victoria House in Ambergris K. 
Um, I think you might like it. Uh, I intend, my, my grandkids are, are two and four right now. I'm hoping that when they get a little older that we take them down there for a vacation because I think for an overseas vacation that's kind of exotic, Belize or Costa Rica or places that you can take families and be really safe. Um, besides uh, the uh, bone fishing, I had the guy take me out to the reef one day and I, I stripped for barracuda. That was like some of these guys mentioned, catching a barracuda is, is just a, a crazy thing. They're so powerful. One, one day we caught, um, I can't remember, it was a really big fish. We took it in for dinner. It fed the whole lodge. It was, I can't remember what it was, but um, uh, <laughs> caught, caught some Jack Traval, not giant Traval, but Jack Traval, they're smaller. They, 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 they will spool you out too. So, but that's kind of what Belize is about. It's, it's a lot of different things. And um, if, you, if you really want a great vacation uh, for you and your, your spouse or your family, um, I check it out. It's very reasonable and it's easy to get to. Um, it used to be known as British Honduras. So it's got a lot of British, uh, you know, background to it. And the people are, are just wonderful. So um, yeah, that's what I'd say about Belize. I think, it, I think it's a, a place that, you know, you can go with the family and if you have people that don't fish, I mean, they, they have things that they can do. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So I think that's uh, that, that's a big advantage of it, and they have much uh, nicer lodges and places to stay uh, than in Mexico. In Mexico, you know, when you go down there, you're just fishing. Uh, there's diving; people go diving there, but um, and I'm not a diver, so I I, I haven't done that. Um, they have these what they call cenotes, and a cenote is basically uh, like a tunnel that goes from the sea right under the the uh, you know the island and they and they actually use uh, diving equipment and go into those tunnels. Um, I'm not interested in doing that, but maybe Rick Vogel, maybe you would be interested in doing that. I I don't know. I I, I think it'd be a little scary. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm not um, I'm not in, I'm not into that type of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. But the diving down there was was great because everything was so close. I I yeah. did 20 different dives to 20 different sites within 20 minutes of our hotel. Um, you don't get that anywhere else. It, yeah. it, it's great. That's great. The, the fishing's fun and everything else is fun too. So um, yeah, it's, it's something to check out if, as they say, if you want to do it with the family. So we, we tried a cenote one time when we were south of Cancun, scary. Mm -hmm. We got in and we got out. It was just, it, it, you couldn't see the, the sun and yeah. see the sky and it was just too claustrophobic. Yeah, Beautiful. yeah. Awesome. I, I I would never do it, but anyway. <laughs> I did do night dives there. That's kind of a hoot. Um, uh, yeah. So anyway. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, I, I I wanted to thank everybody for participating in this uh, program. Um, I also wanted to ask the those that are kind of beginners. I mean, how many of you? Uh, we we need to find out if there is an interest in an outdoor casting session. Um, and, um, you know, uh, and if you need rods, you know, basically how many of you do not have rods? Because what we will do is we'll try to go through the basic of how to set the rod up and then also how to do the basic casting. Um, the, the, the place that Linda and I kind of thought we should do this is that, I can't remember the name of the, the hole. It's the fourth, fourth hole? Uh, no, it's on the Tucson course, the fourth hole. Yeah, on the yeah, Tucson and there's course. a pond there. Backside of Ridgeview. Yeah. By Brassy. So, it's, it's got a wide open field there and we thought we could actually start teaching people to cast. Um, and then if you want to go to the water, you can actually make a cast into the water. Um, but it's not moving water. So it's a little different from a, from a river, um, you know, where, where you can do, um, you know, where you can teach mending and things like that. This on, on a lake, you, you can teach it, but it, it doesn't make, Fine. yeah, it's not the same thing. Um, so I think, I think that's a thing that we need to find out is if there is an interest in it, uh, how many of, of you are interested. Um, so we'll send out a notice in, in terms of, you know, the location and what we're doing here and then try to get uh, some sense of uh, how many of you actually want to do it. Uh, Dean, I do have a couple of things. Okay. Um, since we have an audience here. Uh, your board has been discussing having our first gathering uh, post COVID and it occurred to me when somebody when I think Rick was talking that BC has a whole new meaning now right. 
<laughs> no longer before crisis, before, before COVID. COVID. But before COVID. anyway, um, we we are leaning towards still waiting till like July 4th so that we make sure that everybody is safe. Um, we thought about getting a tennis center and having something outdoors, but uh, stay tuned for that for, for later. Um, okay. And we're also in discussions about a trip to the San Juan in New Mexico by farming to New Mexico. But Dean, um, I've, I've been talking to John Wilmington about that, who has gone there a lot. And, and uh, he said it actually is not open. Uh, and I went to the New Mexico website and looked and they are not, they are discouraging uh, out of staters. So I'm not yeah. entirely clear on what the status is there. Yeah, you probably should wait. So maybe they've locked it back down again. I don't really know. I don't know. Yeah. Do you, does uh, anybody know anything about that? I, I yeah. had a I had a note from Jeff Massey. I thought he said that it was open, but I I know for a fact it's open at San Juan. Uh, yeah. I've talked to Jeff very recently, and uh, it's it's open. They might the the state may be discouraging, but that doesn't mean you can't go and they're. Okay, great guys, thanks. At some point in the future, uh, I, I told Linda, you know, I, I'm leaving here on the 12th to go back home for the first time in two years <laughs> to see my kids and grandkids. And so I'm gonna be there for like four or five weeks actually. And then I'm gonna uh, drive a car back from there to here with my, my daughter and son-in-law um, that I, I'm it's coming off of lease from my company and I wanna, I'm gonna be buying it and bringing it back. <coughs> uh, so. So then, uh, th so then we go back to my, uh, to Maryland at the end of, uh, uh, I guess, beginning of June. So I'll be there until the fall. But so I'll, I'll be seeing you guys when I get back. Um, so other than that, uh, Linda, how do you want to handle the, 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 you know, the thing about the, the casting? You're going to send out a note. Yeah, I'll, I'll send out something. Um, is there a by a raise of hands who who is interested in it? Okay. Okay. Well, um, I'll send something out, and we'll uh, we're currently planning on April seventh, but we'll see who that works for, and if not, then we'll adjust. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being I'll send you the recording. Yeah, they're all. Great. Right. Thanks, Rick. Take care, guys. Bye. Now. Bye. Bye.